three young men might probably have a little bit more time on the roof of that seriously. Well, that's kind of what I thought. That, yeah, he basically said at first, you know, just bring in like you know, sort of like a sack lunch for a brunch, right? Or whatever. Uh, maybe we'll clarify with that then too. We'll so get that in the future. We'll yes. That. All right. Uh, welcome to First Universalist Church of New Madison on this first muggy day. Uh, lots of rain, but we need the rain, so uh, we are more or less, and I'm emphasizing the more or less open. Uh, wear a mask if you feel comfortable, but the governor and the Republican Party says we don't have to wear masks. I still wear mine when I'm out in public, and if my wife is immunocompromised, you're more than welcome to, what, to wear them here if you feel so. Uh, I think everybody here has been vaccinated, and we still are going to maintain the six feet apart. We have hand washing, uh, sterilizer, sanitizer, and all the fuse. Uh, and I do the doorknobs and everything when I come in. So pretty much everything. I don't, do the toilet handles, I forgot that, so. But uh, you wash your hands afterwards anyway, and you don't pick your nose but in the meantime. Uh, all right, this Sunday is going to be kind of unusual for us, uh, hopefully not in the future so much. We are going to have a fully Christian service. Uh, I stole, I'm not stole, I borrowed a sermon from my wife who has 20 years of sermons, and no matter how much I beg her, she, don't, she won't repeat any of them. She's given some really good sermons that I really liked. And I say, can I hear that one again? And she says, no. So I'm going to hear it again because I'm going to give it to you. So I just have to sort through it and find my favorite one. So once a month or maybe once every couple months, we're going to go uh, totally Christian hymns. I even got scripture for you, the whole works. Uh, our slideshow is going to be on Yosemite. I don't know why people kept sending me Yosemite pictures this week or last week, and they were just super impressive. And it's not a wide look at the park. It's not like an overview of Yosemite. It's just amazing pictures like this one that you will see if you go to Yosemite. You may not be able to focus them like that and have the light angles that they have, but the, the scenery is still just unbelievable. Okay. Uh, we are... I We've sent out in the email thing and on Facebook, July 4th is a Sunday. We're going to do a combined service at El Dorado. Uh, the latest word is we meet at the park. We're just going to have a brief service uh, with Derek there. And then we haven't quite figured out how the food thing goes. My understanding of carry-ins is you just bring one dish and everybody shares. 
we were kind of getting the impression that everybody just brings their own sack lunch there. So if there's enough people come, I'm bringing a cake because that's what I always bring because I can make that myself. Uh, and I can eat cake all day by myself. But if anybody's else there and wants to share, I'll trade cake for whatever you got. <laughs> all right. Anything else? Any announcements? Our welcome is 435 in your hymnal. We are so regular church that everything is in the hymnal today. But you don't have to read along unless you want to. <coughs> and I didn't mark them all ahead of time, so I'll give you time to look them up all right. 435. We come together this morning to remind one another to rest for a moment on the forming edges of our lives, to resist that headlong tumble into the next moment until we claim for ourselves awareness and gratitude, taking the time to look into the one another's faces and see their communion, the reflection of our own eyes. This house of laughter and of silence and of memory and of hope is hallowed by our presence together. Good thoughts. And our prelude, David of the White Rock, is a well shown. And I have to give kudos to Roberta. Lloyd texted us or emailed us last night and said he wasn't going to be here today. So I emailed Roberta and said, would you be able to have hymns and everything for today? She didn't get the email. So she comes in today and I said, are you ready? And she says, what? <laughs> but she's got a marvelous history and everything is in the bag so we're all set David of the White Rock of the park is burned. So now it's just a question. Redwoods are usually pretty resilient sequoias, but they said there are sequoias that were still burning like six weeks after the fire. So those trees are dead. So just another idea of what's going on with climate change. Uh, our chalice lighting will be 450. Blessed is the match 
consumed in the kindling flame. Blessed is the flame that burns in the heart's secret places. Blessed is the heart with strength to stop its beating for honor's sake. Blessed is the match consumed in the kindling flame. Something to think about. Our opening hymn in your hymnal is 126. spectacular building built into Yosemite and when we were there this has been I don't know 10 years ago just on the way through on the way to a church conference in San Diego this thing you have to apply for a room here like two years in advance and just for a joke I went up to the desk and said do you have any rooms tonight and she said yes we had a cancellation and my wife I could not talk her into staying and canceling our other reservation we had a chance to stay in the Iwani Inn on a short notice thing like that. What a missed opportunity in life. So I don't know if I'm telling you to leave your wife if they do that to you, but the next time I'm staying. <laughs> okay, children's story. Uh, as you know, I'm kind of on you know, Lincoln binge now. So this is the story of Lincoln's uh, story Lincoln told to the peace commissioners. I'll refer you back to the movie Lincoln. Uh, a really excellent movie, and it was a movie about how the uh, Emancipation Proclamation was passed. It passed like by one or two votes in the Congress of the United States, kind of the same thing that's going on now. And the background is the, the conservative group of the Republican Party, which was the party of Lincoln, which I know that's hard to believe now, would have, was willing to stop the war 
if the South would come for peace meetings and allow the South to keep their slaves and allow the Union to come back together. But then the South would be able to keep their slaves. This was, Lincoln was fighting mightily against that, and this movie is the story of how they worked with each individual or the congressman that they could get to get the votes to support the Emancipation Proclamation. And in the method of doing that, if Lincoln would have admitted that the peace commissioners were on their way to Washington, D.C. for a, a meeting, then everybody would have said, let's not vote on the Emancipation Proclamation because if peace is passed, we won't need to free the slaves. So Lincoln had to come up with a story on how to deal with the peace commissioners, and this is the story that he told. It belongs to the history of the famous interview on board the River Queen at Hampton Roads between himself and Secretary Stewart and the rebel peace commissioners. It was reported at the time that the president told a quote-unquote little story, which if you know Lincoln, he is famous for his little stories. On that occasion, and the inquiry went around among the newspapers, what was it? The New York Herald published what was purported to be a version of it, but the point was entirely lost, and it attracted no attention. Being in Washington a few days subsequent to the interview with the commissioners, my previous sojourn there having been terminated about the last of August, I asked Mr. Lincoln one day if it was true that he told Stevens, Hunter, and Campbell a story. Why, yes, he replied, manifesting some surprise, but has it leaked out? I was in hopes nothing would be told about it, lest some oversensitive people should imagine there was a, a degree of levity in the intercourse between us. Don't you like the way they talked in the 1800s? He then went on to relate the circumstance which called it out. You see, said he, we had reached and were discussing the slavery question. Mr. Hunter said sub uh, substantially that the slaves, always accustomed to an overseer and to work upon compulsion, suddenly freed as they would be if the South should consent to peace on the basis of the Emancipation Proclamation, would precipitate not only themselves, but the entire Southern society into irremediable ruin. No work would be done, nothing would be cultivated, and both blacks and whites would starve. So, do you understand what he's saying? That if the slaves are free because they only work under the whip, because they're forced to work, then everybody in the South will starve because I guess the white people don't know how to plant their own food. So he didn't say that exactly. Said the president, I waited for Seward to answer that argument, but he was silent. I at length said, Mr. Hunter, you ought to know a great deal better about this argument than I, for you have always lived under the slave system. I can only say, in reply to your statement of the case, that it reminds me of a man out in Illinois by the name of Case, who undertook a few years ago to raise a very large herd of hogs. It was a great trouble to feed them, and how to get around this was a puzzle to him. At length, he turned the whole herd into the field and let them have full swing, thus saving not only the labor of feeding the hogs, but also of digging, oh, I missed the potato part. At length, he hit on a plan of planting an immense field of potatoes. And when they were sufficiently grown, he turned the whole herd into the field and let them have full swing, saving not only the labor of feeding the hogs, but also that of digging the potatoes. Charmed with his sagacity, he stood one day, leaning against the fence, counting his hogs when a neighbor came along. Well, well, said he, Mr. Case, this is all very fine. Your hogs are doing very well now. But you know, out here in Illinois, the frost comes early and the ground freezes a foot deep. Then what are you going to do? This was a view of the matter that Mr. Case had not taken into account. Butchering time for hogs was way on in December or January. He scratched his head and at length stammered, well, it may come pretty hard on their snouts, but I don't see but that it will be root hog or die. Has anybody heard that phrase before and did not know it came from a Lincoln story? Root hog or die in the frozen field of potatoes is what he's telling the white southerners. If the blacks won't raise your food for you and you won't raise your own food, then I guess you're up the creek. So, another Lincoln farm story. This is the uh, inside of the Iwani Inn 
unbelievably impressive if you've been to any of the national parks. Actually, if you've even been to state parks, if you've been down to Houston Woods, they have an inn down there that's pretty impressive on the inside too. And I highly recommend, it's a fun place to stay. They've got a, a nice uh, lake there. You can rent boats. Uh, they've got cabins that you can rent. So, okay, affirmation. Where's my... What do I do with my paper? The affirmation is 466. This is one with a response if you'd like to join in. 466. Let religion be to us life and joy. Let it be a voice of renewing challenge to do the best we have and may be. Let it be a call to generous action. Let religion be to us the dissatisfaction with things that are, which bids us serve more eagerly the true and the right. Let it be the sorrow that opens for us the way of sympathy, understanding, and service to suffering for humanity. Let religion be to us the wonder and lure of that which, it, it, which is only partly known and understood. And I that glory in nature's majesty and beauty and a heart that rejoices in deeds of kindness and of courage. Let religion be to us security and serenity because of its truth and beauty and because of the enduring worth and power of the loyalties which it engenders. Let it be to us hope and purpose and the discovery of opportunities to express our best through daily acts. Religion uniting us with all that is admirable in human beings everywhere. Holding before our eyes a prospect of the better life for humankind, which each may help to make actual. By Vincent P. Silliman. Okay. Joys and concerns. Do we have any to share? The Palestinian situation has not gotten any better, and uh, actually we're working, uh, Roberta has some presentation to make on that, and that'll be coming up in the next few weeks. Looking forward to hear uh, kind of a history, and uh, we were kind of puzzling over, you know, if you look for a map of Palestine, there isn't one, because Palestine pretty much doesn't exist anymore. It existed in the, in the uh, Holy Land in the time of the, the Bible was written, and it actually had occupied that territory between Jordan and the Mediterranean, which is now has been given to the state of Israel to form a new country, and they were supposed to coexist with the Palestinians. And I think you all know what happened there. So, yes. But we still hear of Palestinians. The Palestinians, and that's why we hear of the Palestinians have no state. They even live in the territory they've lived in for thousands of years, but it's not their territory. If you, there's a couple things on PBS. Uh, where Israel is becoming, it's starting to, to look like South Africa. They've built a big wall around the Palestinian uh, enclaves where the Palestinians live. The settlers go in and, and dig up Palestinian farms and kill their olive trees, take their land and build settlements on it, and then build walls and roads, private roads that only the Israeli settlers can drive on. Uh, there's just lots of conflict between the two. So. But we'll give you a little history and a little more of a big slideshow on how all this stuff has happened. And I may call on Rick, remember Rick Bohamus, who spoke here from the Christian Peacemakers teams. He's got unbelievably interesting slides and stories. Anything else? I would just express concern um, in terms of major pieces of legislation in Congress. I, I bring this up because we're talking about compromise from the White House as well as those members of Congress. There are opportunities abounding in that. Let's all hope, and it's my concern, that if we can get compromised just this time, perhaps it'll set a new precedent for the old days, if you will, productivity and good policy resulting from a very important principle called compromise and reconciliation. Yes, we are at the cusp of change where compromise is offered and they can choose compromise or the same people can stay with their hard-edged, rock-ribbed, 
frozen in place attitudes and we'll just have to see whether reality impinges on their life and, and makes an impression on them or whether they stick to where they're living now. All right, there are no more. Uh, all of those hopes and dreams, fears, uh, the problems in life that we don't want to share with others, you can put them into God's hands and he will share and she will share and they will share with you and with us. All right. John 3, 14, 21. This is a sermon from Tara, my wife, given in March 13th of 1994. So this is early in her history as a pastor. She started in uh, about 87, 86 or 87. And then we moved to Pleasant Hill in 88. And she had her first full-time church job in, in 88. So she was uh, had a few years under her belt, but there's still some interesting things that I'll probably point out to you. Uh, because this is our standard Christian sermon, we are going to have scripture. So our first scripture is John 3, 14 through 23. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him, in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all those who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. And then Jesus and John the Baptist, that's uh, verse 22, after Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he spent some time there with them and baptized. John also was baptizing at the Aenean near Salim, because the water was abundant there, and the people kept coming and were baptized. And now Ephesians 2, uh, 1 through 10. This is from the New Revised Standard Edition, as was the other. From death to life, you were dead throughout the trespasses and sins in which you once lived. Following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of the flesh and senses. We were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been given, you have been saved through faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Now there's a whole sermon right in that little phrase by itself. As you know, some religions, and I can't remember whether it's the Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, I know the Presbyterians believe in predestination, there are certain segments of Christianity that believe that you are everything is going to happen no matter what you do about it. You are saved by the grace of God and good works have nothing to do with it. In other words, if you live a good life, if you're not if you don't believe in God, you're not going to be saved. Other people believe in good works. Uh, this was part of the Catholic Church and part of the problem the Catholic Church had in the medieval times that brought about the Reformation. You could buy your way into heaven. If you committed crimes or had done sins against God, if you gave money to the church, they gave you dispensation and gave you a pass into heaven. That's one of the things that the Lutherans uh, and the Reformation was all about. 
Okay, the title of this sermon is To Believe Again, and you can kind of see where that comes from. Belief can go in two directions, and what the Bible was asking there was for us to believe in God and we will be rewarded. Belief can go in other directions too, and that's where this sermon goes. So I want you to pay attention and catch when she makes that. Please pray with me. God of grace, fill us this day with the sense of your presence as we consider your word to us this day. Extend to us your grace and the openness to your being that we might be filled with your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Both our readings for today have to do with judgment and grace. When we think of judgment and grace, I just had finals on Friday. This is in 94 when she was going to uh, Earlham to get her, doctor, her uh, master's degree in religion. I uh, lost my place. It reminds me of those pearly gates joke, jokes with St. Peter, standing there giving people admission tests and pop quizzes before he lets them in. Like the one about the mathematician who died and went to heaven and met Peter at the pearly gates. Can you imagine Peter giving people quizzes? Peter announced that he was giving everyone a pop quiz that day. What two days of the week begin with T? The mathematician? Today and tomorrow. Today and tomorrow, exactly. And the second question, how many seconds in a year? Two. January 2nd, February 2nd, March 2nd, April 2nd, so there's 12, yes. And what was the name of the Son of God? This is the best one. And the mathematician just being, he knew that, everybody knows that. Do you know it? Yeah. Andy. Andy, yeah. Andy walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me so. Yeah. <clears throat> We can all get confused on tests. Anxiety rates, uh, anxiety rates rise at the end of the term comes upon us and we wonder if we are studying the right topics. My theology professor, which could have been Nancy, constructed the finals from the questions we came up with in class. Each class time we would choose three questions which we felt we had discussed thoroughly in class, which meant we had 57 essay questions. From those questions, the professor chose 15 questions to be on the final. On the day of the final, four essay questions were drawn from an envelope. One of those questions for the final exam was most appropriate for a final exam. You are visiting a woman in the hospital. She has just been told she is dying of cancer. She asks, am I going to heaven? What do you say? The scriptures for today give us clear guidance on those kinds of ultimate questions. For God so loved the world, God is the one who is love itself. And out of that love of the world and everything it in, is in it, God sent his son, Jesus, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel writer says that Jesus came into the world not to condemn but to save. So if we interpret the scripture into our lives at most important junctures, like the woman's question, am I going to heaven? What do we say? How do we respond? And of course, this is a class of people who will be in that situation. This is a class of ministers. It is an important question. What would you say to the woman? Do you think you will go to heaven? Or a similar response might help the woman to talk about her fears? about her feelings of grace and judgment issues. We might talk together about transformation and living a resurrected life beginning now. The Apostle Paul in writing to the Ephesians described the lives of the people in that church as spiritually dead. He was blunt, he didn't hold back. He just said you were dead through, through the trespasses and sins because of the way you are living. Following the course of this world and just going with the flow. There's a t-shirt out there that perfectly illustrates a Christian in this world. On the t-shirt are large, colorful fish, attractive, beautiful fish. But if you look closely, they are all barracudas and sharks and large predator fish, all except one, a simple fish symbol, the Christian symbol of fish, and it is swimming in the opposite direction. On the bottom of the t-shirt, it simply says, against the flow. That is what 
needs to happen in a world where to go with the flow means you're so busy watching out for our own comfort that we cannot imagine taking any sort of personal risk. Consider the man who went to see the pastor of the inner city church. Though the pastor was used to conditions of poverty and want surrounding his parish, he was touched by the story this man told him. The man described the needs of a poor widow. She has four hungry children to feed, is confined to her bed with no money for a doctor, and she owes three months' rent and is about to be evicted from her apartment. The man then explained he was trying to help raise the needed rent money, $600. Digging into his own wallet while racking his brains for other solutions, the pastor applauded this man's concern and commitment. Of course I'll help, he said. If you can give your time to this cause, so can I. By the way, how do you know this woman? I'm the landlord. I can sympathize. This is a, a 20th century version of the world Paul was addressing. The latter in the letter to the Ephesians. A world of persons going with the flow, looking out for number one. Paul described the life of going with the flow and being dead because of it. And he says we all have that in common. At one point or another, we have lived according to our own wants and desires. And then he says, but God. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead. But God made us alive together with Christ. A gift of love, by grace you have been saved. God wants the best for each of us. We are created to live in love and out of grace. God offers us an alternative path from just going with the flow, swimming with the sharks, and bobbing along with the barracudas. God offers us an opportunity to believe again, to believe that we are recreated in Christ's image each time we chose to walk in God's ways. We make God's love more available to everyone. We make God's love accessible for others by walking in good works. The translation of the Greek to English loses some of the sense when we read or think about good works as something that we just do. The scripture says that we are products of God created in Christ unto good works. We move into good works which God has prepared for us so that we might walk in them. Walking in good works means not only you do not do good works, but you are in the midst of them, surrounded by a kind of inclusive well-being. Inviting others to participate by a kind of uh, inclusive well-being, helping those who are in need, receiving grace and love because God calls us to this new life. To believe again helps us to understand that new life is offered now, and continual renewal can happen moment to moment in which each moment of our existence and beyond into the change from this life to the next. Because eternal life begins here. This is the first day of the rest of eternity, and we need to be able to risk going against the flow. Now we go back to the woman in the hospital. She needs more than anything to know that God loves her and calls her to turn from the tide of fear. She needs to hear about grace and love. She needs to hear that she was given the gift of life so that she might know God's love and walk in love from this day forward. We are the ones who tell the woman in the hospital about God's love. We are the ones, by walking in good works ourselves, through God's grace, that we are the ones to believe again so that others believe. We are the ones who celebrate what the, and I'll quote her, the Father has done for us, and I can tell you that in the years that have progressed, it's no longer the Father, it's Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. Uh, she started out in a conservative church, and I think she kind of twisted or moved that church a little bit on the dial toward a little more accepting. All right, and then loved us when we didn't think we were worth it. God offers to us the possibility of transformation at all times through Christ. God's love is a healing of pain and release from sin. Sin being anything that comes between us and the holy. We can help the person come to know that God's forgiveness is always available to us and that it is not an earned thing. 
but a journey of living towards God and asking God to be a part of that. And that it is never too late to believe again. As we begin to live in daily, in the daily from the forgiveness of sins and toward transformation, we begin to realize the kingdom of God for ourselves and others. When the change comes from this life to the next, it will be a fuller fellowship with the most love we have ever known. On that day, we will celebrate God's grace and rejoice in the opportunity to believe again. Any comments? I'm partial, but I think she's uh, quite a quite a speaker. Uh, and hers, they always have a little humor. They always have a little bit of something that touches you, and they always have an interesting twist that teaches you something. So, and she's done that week after week after week, and never will repeat herself. Yes. What church did she grow up in? She grew up in a Methodist church. Methodist. Yes, we became Church of the Brethren, and when we first got married, neither one of us was actually going to church. Uh, I was a Presbyterian. And we would go occasionally on the high holy days like everybody else. Uh, we got married in the church. We had the minister marry us. He actually married us on the farm, in the barn where we practiced. Uh, we cleaned everything up and had a, had a wedding out there. But our Presbyterian minister was a really nice guy, uh, married us. When we got married and started having foster kids, we decided we needed some help because we started out with teenagers, which was a big mistake. We needed some help, so we decided we need to go to a church and get some people behind us. There were two churches within a mile of where we lived. One was the Church of the Brethren and one was the Methodist Church. We went to each and sat through a Sunday and just felt called to the Church of the Brethren. Uh, we were farmers. We always had lived kind of a simple life. Uh, did not believe in ostentation or spending money in, uh, in places where you shouldn't. And we also believed in, if not conscious objection, at least the peace stance that peace should come before war and every attempt should be made to, to reach peace before you go to war, the Church of the Brethren pretty much fit us. And when we got there, she has a theater background and a speaking background. So whenever the pastor was gone, they would ask her to speak. And pretty soon other people were asking her to speak. So she kind of got drawn into the ministry, which changed our lives irrevocably because we had a dairy farm at the time, milking 50 cows and had 100 cows total. I found out I couldn't farm by myself. I couldn't farm without her. I would go out to chop silage, chop a load, get off the chopper, come back, blow up the silo, go back, chop another load. You know, when you got two people, one person just chops all the time and the other person unloads all the time, so it gets done in half the time. So, kind of the way life takes you in places you didn't plan. <laughs> okay, uh, Yosemite again. I like this one. Uh, the guy on the path, and this wasn't planned. This is just the way it kind of turned out. But I found the same guy in two different, two other pictures on there. One of them on kind of a misty morning, and it's not the same guy. This guy's an old guy like me with white hair. And the guy on the right is just in a different position. So you can see Yosemite is kind of a mystical place. Uh, it's The mystery is there when you find it. And that's kind of what religion is. Religion can be something that's cut and dried and give me money and I'll give you rewards. Or it can be something that's mystical and spiritual and really uplifting. So obviously we're hoping that you're choosing the latter. Okay, uh, it's time for the offering 672. Once again, everything's out of the hymn book. That's way back there. Way back there. And Sexton wrote, Look to your heart that flutters in and out like a moth. God is not indifferent to your need. You have a thousand prayers. God has but one. Dear God, we give thanks for those moments when we can feel that we live in a world that is not indifferent to our needs. We all have so many needs, a thousand prayers, a thousand needs, that really only need one answer. Let the world not be indifferent. And may we live and be with each other in the way that shows this truth, whatever the day brings. That neither are we indifferent to each other. This is by Judith Meyer. Uh, as usual, you're with the
decided to put something in the plate, you can put something in, you can take something out. Don't feel compelled to do that. Uh, we are getting subscriptions that are keeping us afloat. Do that only as a means of being part of our community. Okay. Once again, 
this is probably the last time I'm going to put them in the freezer and take them out again. <laughs> so, uh, enjoy the, the water's hot if you want an instant coffee or an instant tea. All right. And these are the Bridal Falls, and a lot of people don't know if you look at the one on the, let's see, it would be your left. There are actually three falls there. There's the main falls at the top, which everybody gets a picture of, and then you can just see on that, there's kind of a leveling out where it just has a really short fall, and then there's another fall clear at the bottom. So if you're in the right place at the right time, which this photographer was, you can get a really spectacular picture. And then, of course, you can get an even more spectacular picture when the sun's rays are out because the falls are lit up by the setting sun and it looks like they're on fire, which I've been told that is a pretty incredible sight to do. Okay, uh, extinguishing the chalice is our closing words, 482. It is, it, it is, is, if it is language that makes us human, one half of language is to listen. Silence cannot exist without speech, but speech cannot live without silence. Listen to the speech of others, listen even more to their silence. To pray is to listen to the revelations of nature, to the meanings of events. To listen to music is to listen also to silence, and to find the stillness deepened and enriched. Profound words from Jacob Trapp. Okay. And our postlude, son of my soul, son S-U-N. Yes, first Sunday. Oh, Fish Sunday. Yes. Anybody wants to, the fish basket is up here. So anybody that wants to come up before we get done, thanks for reminding me. Today is Fish Sunday. Today. 
today. The first Sunday of every month is the first Sunday. And the fish bowl is always here. And it does not have sharks or bear food. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, I, I would just uh, try to check with you. Um, I'm going to be gone the next two Sundays because we're going to my daughter's in New York. Oh, okay. Good um, time. And so, am I going to miss the Palestinian sermon? or What do you want to do that, Roberta? No, we'll wait for you. Well, no, no, no. Do, do not do that. You're a, you're a very important person in our congregation. You and, sing. <laughs> and, and you express an interest in the service. So, yes, number one, you sing. But number two, you, you express an interest in a presentation that's totally flexible. So why would we do it if you're not here? So. Well, I never know. The, the only problem with that is I never know until Sunday whether I'm coming or not. So if you held it and me, and then I, I woke up and, oh, I'm so tired. You know what we do? What? You know what we do? You can hold it for another Sunday. Oh, no. My boy's got stuff in the bag. Yeah, I, I can always pop something. Fun. Well, I know, but I, I hate I, I want to do it before too long. Who knows what Palestine's going to do between now and whenever. So, three or four weeks. You know, I try to follow the news, and I, and I don't know what those who say that it's still a problem. Uh, I mean, they they stop, they stop firing back and forth at each other, but... Uh, well, it's always a problem. Yeah. So well, the problem is there's like hundreds and hundreds of buildings. There's like thousands of people who are homeless now. Yes. And the Israelis, there's two problems. One is the Israelis won't let things like concrete and steel. Everything's in embargo. Everything's embargo. The second problem is, and the reason the Israelis do that is because the Hamas takes half the concrete and half the steel and they build more tunnels to, to launch rockets out of. Yeah. But it's kind of the thing when... We talked about this before. If you see a poor person driving a Cadillac and you say, okay, I'm not giving anybody any poor people. Just because you've seen one person do something wrong, you're making everybody innocent and suffer. It's kind of what's happening. And I'm sure if somebody put their arms to it, there's a way to make sure that the country will be in the boring building or the other side of the site. You know, some and on the site. I mean, all you have to do is have observers there, unprotected. It's hard to find people who are on the road. He's really still building houses and moving into them. Yes. And, and then they say, OK, them. it's ours. We're living here. Yes. And it's on Palestinian well, land. Well, I sent the word of a map of Palestine in 1920. The whole area, actually it looks like the whole area between the Mediterranean Sea and the New York and it's green. So that. 1947, the end of the Israelis the homeland, and they carved it out of Palestine. And then that's not the distance about half of what was Palestinian. It's still green. You know, the whole thing on the Mediterranean side is all the Israel. Then the Palestinians and the other Arabs stupidly thought they could invade Israel and wipe them off the map. They ended up getting their butts back, and they lost a bunch more territory. So in 1947, the Palestinian shrunk even more. Now what's happening is, like you say, the Israelis are making sons in the West Bank and in Gaza. And they're taking the Palestinians out, building walls around it, and going into the Palestinians' houses and they've lived there for hundreds of years saying, that's my house, I'm taking your house. And they have a legal system that allows them to do that. We don't know that it's supposed to be not be able to. Palestinian 